Greetings, everyone! Some time ago, I reviewed Archie's Sonic Issue 13 and the Sonic & Knuckles 48-page special, semi-adaptions of Sonic 3 and Sonic & Knuckles, respectively. I say semi-adaptions because elements from the games were incorporated into those stories, to varying degrees. However, there was one major element from both Sonic 3 and Sonic & Knuckles that did not appear in these two adaptions, and it was the major focus of the games, the Death Egg. I suppose there wasn't enough time to incorporate it into the stories proper, and doing things like turning the floating island into Robotnik's Flying Fortress is a good compromise, but they could have at least tried to incorporate one of the biggest things about the Sonic games into this continuity. Well thankfully they fixed that, as today, we're taking a look at a mini-series focusing on the Death Egg appropriately titled The Death Egg Saga. Oh I'm sorry, the actual title is Sonic Quest The Death Egg Saga. I've never understood the Sonic Quest part. I mean, the title is accurate, Sonic will be going on a quest, but was this meant to be part of an ongoing series that would have run alongside the main book? I guess we'll never know. Before we get started, I should note that this mini-series takes place right after issue 41. What you need to know is, Sonic, Sally, and Jeffrey Skunk Boy St. John traveled to the creepy dimension known as the Zone of Silence and finally rescued Sally's father, King Acorn. So let's see what happens afterward. Oh, and I should note, I'll be using scans from the Sonic Select 6 version of the miniseries. I will reveal why when I get to a certain point. We start with Skunk Boy sneaking into Knot Hole. His efforts were for Knot as Sonic ambushes him. Before the two go at it again, Sally interrupts them. Turns out, she invited Jeffrey to fulfill a specific purpose. After rescuing the King in issue 41, his health has taken a turn for the worst. Thanks to being in the Zone of Silence for years, readjusting to Mobius' atmosphere has caused him to be disoriented and delusional. Dr. Quack has temporarily stabilized his condition, but his mind is still gone. Not to mention, his body's turning into crystal. Sally wants to keep the King's return a secret until his health is sorted out, for the sake of the general public. That's where Skunk Boy comes in. He's to stand guard outside and keep the secret while the Freedom Fighters figure out a way to restore the King's health. And that's all he does in this story. No joke. He doesn't get in the way of our heroes this time. He just stands guard. Tails notes that the King's crystallized skin strongly resembles a Chaos Emerald. Sonic gets an idea. Since Chaos Emeralds and Rings are linked, he'd figure using his one billionth ring, which he kept it mounted by the way, may have some effect on him. Indeed it does. The King briefly sounds sane, until he collapses. Since the ring was already used to send Sonic on that wacky vision quest in issue 35, and give him his super plot armor, they'll need fresh ones. Sally has two ideas on where to find some without heading into those pesky special zones. There's the Lake of Rings Sonic found back in issue 38. Bunny and Antoine will head there. Then there's that Power Ring Grotto on the outskirts of Robotropolis. The one that kinda collapsed at the end of the Supersonic vs. Hyper Knuckles special, back when the titular characters duked it out. She's hoping it didn't completely collapse and some rings may still be present. That's Sonic and Tails' job. Guess which group we'll be following. Meanwhile in Robotropolis, Dr. Robotnik exposits to Snively that despite the recent earthquake, his latest project is ready. He leaves Snively in charge of the reconstruction efforts while he heads up to said project. As soon as Robotnik's out of sight, Snively immediately orders the SWAT bots to start waiting on him hand and foot and rename the city to Snivopolis. Um, shouldn't you wait until Robotnik, like, dies before doing stuff like that, Snively? Yeah, this'll probably backfire. Anyway, Sonic and Tails reach the Power Ring Grotto, only to find a dome covering it. To find out how this happened, Sonic heads to the nearby Mobian Cliffs to make contact with a Freedom Fire faction led by Carl Condor. While Tails watches the dome. Maybe Sonic should have stuck around for a bit because right after he leaves, the dome opens up and a tube from above goes inside it. It starts sucking up all of the rings and it continues to suck as it heads back into the sky, taking Tails and a bunch of debris with it. Sonic reaches the Mobian Cliffs and starts looking for Carl when something else catches his eye a solar eclipse. Only, one wasn't predicted for today, and the object doesn't look like a moon. 
something fast enters Sonic's side, and it turns out to be Carl Condor. Or rather, a robotized Carl Condor, who successfully ambushes Sonic. On board the object, aka Robotnik's project, the Doctor berates a SWAT bot for failing to stop the sucking tube from earlier. As a result, not only is there excess weight on board, it'll take time for Robotnik to sort out the power rings from the debris. Robotnik has a fitting punishment. Smash the SWAT bot's head, and send it to the garbage heap below. This delay won't ruin Robotnik's mood, as he will soon roboticize the world from high above his new weapon, the Death Egg. We finally got to the reason why I've decided to use the Sonic Select 6 scans instead of the originals. Notice that Issue 2's coloring is off on a number of pages. When I first read this story in my youth, I thought it was some cool effect. But nowadays, I've read it's a printing error that wasn't fixed. Well, obviously they fixed it for Sonic Select 6, many years later. So yeah, this is the reason I chose the graphic novel scans. I could have done the originals, but it seems jarring to me now, and probably to you too. Anyway, Robotnik contacts Snively, who's getting a back massage, to see how the reconstruction's going. Snively's all, yeah, the SWAT bots are still at it and totally not pampering me all the time. We get more exposition. The rings from the grotto are being arranged in a chainmail fashion within the Death Egg shell, making it invulnerable to external attack. There is one more thing needed to bring the Death Egg to full power. A Chaos Emerald. But first, he needs to dump all the excess debris so that the Death Egg can achieve the proper altitude. In said debris, Tails comes across the SWAT bot Robotnik wrecked earlier, and gets an idea. He quickly jury-rigs it to act as a power suit for him, so he can walk around the Death Egg unnoticed. Despite the obvious damage on the head, Tails' disguise works perfectly, tricking the SWAT bot responsible for dumping the debris into said debris area and pushing the dump button, not to mention fooling Robotnik himself. Heading over to Sonic, it turns out he was playing possum when Carl Condor captured him. As they approach the Death Egg, Sonic begins attacking the robot. Bold move, Sonic, considering you're still high in the sky. Luckily, the debris dumping was happening at this time, allowing Sonic into the Death Egg and taking care of Carl Condor Bot. So long, Carl. We hardly knew ye. Literally. Unfortunately, being on board means Sonic cannot contact Sally on his progress due to a jamming signal. This brings us to a one-page update on the knothole situation. The King's crystallization is now at 68% and growing. They've lost contact with Sonic and Tails due to what I said earlier, and Buddy and Antoine got themselves lost thanks to Antoine being in charge of the Lake of Rings map. On the Death Egg's bridge, or control chamber, Tails sees where Robotnik will easily get his Chaos Emerald, the Floating Island. Knuckles spots the approaching Death Egg and decides to take it on. However, one small echidna is no match for a giant battle station. It's no wonder he wasn't vaporized on the spot. Good thing Mighty and the rest of the Chaotix are there to catch our deep-fried friend. Robotnik launches two giant Burrowbot Batniks to go after the Emeralds. Yes, Robotnik has detected two Emeralds on the island. Knuckles got a second Emerald as backup in the aforementioned Supersonic vs. Hyper Knuckles special. The Burrowbots don't get a chance to search for them as Knuckles and the Chaotix make short work of them. Speaking of robot smashing, Sonic's been leaving a trail of broken SWAT bots on his way to the bridge. He arrives in time to hear Robotnik's new plan to get the Emeralds. He'll just use the Death Egg itself to sink the island, drowning every little thing on it and collecting the Chaos Emeralds afterwards. And he's overriding numerous safety systems to do it. He's that determined. Well, that determination unfortunately pays off. Despite having Chaos Emeralds on its side, the island starts sinking into the water thanks to the Death Egg. Tails, still in a SWAT bot disguise, leaves the control room to find a way to stop Robotnik. Only he runs into Sonic, who believes he's dealing with one more SWAT bot. After some beating, Sonic realizes he's attacking his little buddy. Oops. At least he apologizes for the mistake. They need to stop Robotnik from sinking the floating island, so Sonic heads straight for the big guy. Robotnik is actually ready for him. Walls quickly come down around the hedgehog, and poison gas starts filling the area. Don't worry, Sonic. Iron Tails is here to rescue you. He even has his own blasters. 
Tails destroys the control consoles, not only freeing Sonic, but forcing the Death Egg up towards space. This of course frees the floating island from its grasp, and leaving Knuckles blissfully unaware of the full picture. See you later, buddy. Robotnik retreats into another chamber and calls Sonic and Tails on the monitors. He reveals that back when Sonic was roboticized, he took some design elements and pumped them up and up and up until it became the next obstacle Sonic has to deal with. Everyone, say hello to Silver Sonic. Sonic sends Tails back into the control room so he can find a way to deal with the Death Egg. Good idea, Sonic. However, you might want to wait until Silver Sonic is dealt with first. Sure, you may believe you can deal with this thing by yourself, but wouldn't you fare better by having Iron Tail stick around for a bit? Especially since stuff like your figure 8 technique barely scratches the thing. The fight causes damage to the walls, exposing some broken live wires, which Sonic uses to short out Silver Sonic. Robotnik's not happy with this and decides to deal with Sonic personally. He puts on some armor of his own, the Ego Skeleton, and heads towards the Hedgehog. The suit is tied into the Death Egg's power systems, so he should take care of Sonic easily, right? Well, no. When Robotnik enters the area Sonic's at, he instead finds Silver Sonic operational again. That's because Sonic borrowed the idea of using a broken robot as power armor from Tails. At least to give Sonic a fighting chance against a power-suited Robotnik. You know, seeing these two duking out, it feels like I'm watching a superhero versus supervillain battle. It's the look of Robotnik's suit that makes me think of this, though the mask kinda makes Robotnik look more like an evil luchador. Hmm, there's an idea there. Sadly, this goofy yet awesome fight comes to an end with Sonic knocking Robotnik out of the Death Egg. Tails shows up to tell Sonic he's rigged the Death Egg to explode within 20 minutes. But the fight with Robotnik has damaged the internal systems, so it could go boom at any time. The two head for a nearby hatch, where there just happens to be a box of power rings nearby. I guess Robotnik wanted some in reserve. Well, good thing too, because this allows our heroes to complete their original mission to help the king with some. They make it out and land safely on the planet below, just in time to witness the explosion. They re-establish contact with Sally, and they head back to Knothole, hoping to cure the king with the rings. Spoilers, this doesn't work. The story's not over yet as we see Robotnik surviving the explosion and parachuting down to his horror, Snivopolis. He lands in his office and wants to have a word with Snively. However, when he landed, he unintentionally smushed Snively on his back. Yeah, Robotnik provided a reasonable punishment for the weasel without knowing it. And that's how the miniseries ends. Let's start with the King Acorn subplot. His crystallization is a nod to the Sad AM episode, The Void. In that episode, the King, along with a crystal-controlling wizard named Nagus, escaped from the Void at the end of the episode. However, since they were stuck there for so long, their bodies started turning into crystal and had to go back into the Void to survive. In this case, our heroes have worked so hard to rescue the king from the Zone of Silence that putting him back there to save him would be the last thing on their minds. Plus, there is no crystal-controlling wizard to explain these things. Not yet, anyway. So our heroes are trying to find ways to fix the king using power rings. Now, this subplot will continue in later issues, but its purpose here is to bring Sonic and Tails into the true plot of the miniseries. And it's a good thing Sonic and Tails were sent to the Power Ring Grotto instead of Bunny and Antoine. Otherwise, Robotnik might have won. I don't know, maybe Bunny's strength and Antoine's clumsiness could come in handy in this situation. Robotnik's plan in general, using the Death Egg to roboticize the entire planet from high above, is one of his most ambitious ones at this point. The Death Egg in the games was just a massive battle station that can lay waste to the lands below. The comic version is a little more frightening. Not only does it have strong offensive and defensive capabilities, it has the potential to turn you into a robotic slave on a whim. The miniseries has shoutouts to both Sonic 2 and Sonic 3 and & Knuckles. Sonic has to face off against a large Sonic robot, 
essentially the Mecha Sonic of 16-Bit Sonic 2 with the name of the Robot Sonic from 8-Bit Sonic 2. It's the penultimate boss before the Hedgehog fights Robotnik. Now get this, as I was rereading the miniseries in preparation for this review, I noticed something I didn't realize before. This is a twist on the iconic Sonic 2 Final Battle. In the game, Sonic fights Robotnik, who's in a giant mech that resembles him. Here, the situation's reversed, with Sonic in a giant mech resembling himself, fighting Robotnik. Yes, Robotnik's still wearing a power suit, but he was still his regular size. That's actually kind of amazing. I don't think that's what the creators were going for, but hey, that's my interpretation here. The Floating Island and its Chaos Emeralds briefly served their Sonic 3 and Knuckles purpose. Robotnik wants the Chaos Emerald, uh, the Master Emerald doesn't exist yet, to bring the Death Egg to full power. While he succeeded in the game, he failed in the comic, thanks to Sonic and Tails. Not before the nod of the Death Egg forcing the island into the water, and the contact point being the volcano. The role of Knuckles and the Chaotix is to defend the island, which is fine. We've already done the trick Knuckles shtick in previous issues. It wants to keep the focus on Sonic, Tails, Robotnik, and the Death Egg. It would explain why Skunk Boy is relatively on good terms with our heroes in this miniseries. Manny Galen's art is a mixed bag. Sometimes it looks great. Other times, the characters look off. Seriously, look at Snively here. Sonic Quest The Death Egg Saga gets an overall score of 8 out of 10. Like with the Mecha Madness arc, Gallagher has found this nice balance of seriousness and goofiness. Despite the art issue I mentioned earlier and the fact the characters are describing their actions while doing it, there's still some charm to this saga. Continuity is respected and the action is again ridiculous and awesome. Some of you might be pointing this out in the comments, so I'll save you the trouble. Yeah, I realize I didn't bring up the Star Wars nods because I didn't need to. If you're familiar with the original film, the nods speak for themselves. Plus, there wasn't that many, so I didn't feel the need to bring them up. It's a shame that Death Egg was limited to this miniseries. It could have been useful as a moving fortress for our main villain, able to go where he pleases and launching various attacks. Just put some limitations on it to keep it from reaching full power and you're good to go. Perhaps sometime in the future. Anyway, have a good day everyone. Characters were rocking power suits this miniseries. I wonder if any other characters will wear one in the future. Maybe someone like Rotor. Nah, I don't see that happening.